Uh, well, thank you all very much for being here. Um, and, uh, of course, thank you all for your, your great contributions to uh, uh, preservation archaeology and um, everything you're doing for Archaeology Southwest. It's really um, it's really great to see people. I've worked and lived in the Four Corners for quite a while before I came uh, back to school down here in Tucson. And um, it's really incredible to see that it's not just the local communities up there that really care about these places. And that, you know, basically uh, in this much larger northern south or uh, uh, greater southwest that people are banding together to try to help preserve these landscapes. Um, so today I'm going to be speaking with you about uh, a big component of my dissertation research, really uh, kind of ropes all the different kind of components in. And I'm, as Bill suggested, I'm... Uh, doctoral candidate at the University of Arizona, uh, School of Anthropology in the Tree Ring Lab. Some of my advisors and committee members are here today, um, so hopefully I don't uh, embarrass them too much. Um, yeah, so um, today I'm going to be speaking with you about uh, some of the building mural uh, research I've been doing in southeastern Utah. Um, I first started working in southeastern Utah back in 2006 for the Comb Ridge Heritage Initiative Project. Um, big survey up and down Comb Ridge, Butler Wash, Comb Wash, uh, under Winston Hearst as a crew chief on that project. And uh, I'd always really been drawn to this landscape. We actually used to come down to southeastern Utah when I was in uh, middle school and high school for spring break, basically in, in March winter's only about a third of the way over in Wyoming, and so everybody wants to, you know, get out of Dodge. So you go down to Utah the time of year, and it's all County 22 Wyoming license plates. Um, so I really was uh, very fortunate to get a job back in 2006 um, and start working on that project, and then basically really was drawn to working in this area since then. Um, and so when I had the opportunity to come back to school to work on a dissertation, um, I was really gravitated towards, towards using this area as, as uh, uh, the place to generate my uh, research data. Um, so yes, we're going to be talking about painted walls and tree ring dates. Um, before I jump into this too much, though, I'd like to dedicate this talk to a really good friend of mine that passed away a few weeks ago. Um, we were good friends for a long time. He's an archaeologist, uh, just finished his dissertation uh, down here, Saul Hedquist. Uh, he's a friend, mentor, and scholar, a uh, good friend to a lot of us here. So um, just a little shout-out to good friend Saul. He was really instrumental in getting me to come back to school. And then when I got back to Tucson, or got down to Tucson, um, really helped me get a, um, get a foothold in here, helped me find a place to rent. And uh, I was my roommate for, for a couple semesters. All right. Um, so uh, the area I'm going to be talking about is uh, what we used to call the Greater Cedar Mesa area. Um, back in, in the early 2000s, um, basically, we didn't really think about the area in terms of the Bears Ears landscape. The Bears Ears are, of course, these two buttes that sit um, about in here, let's say. Um, but uh, so we used to call this the Cedar Mesa area, and that's really where I started doing my research. But of course, now we, we think of this as kind of the southern part of the Bears Ears area. So um, Bill spoke with you about here's that blue uh, line, what was the Obama designation of the monument. And so this yellow area here is really where I've been focusing uh, most of my research. Um, kind of thought about it a different way. We can think about it in terms of archaeological cultures. Um, so here we have the four corners. Um, and this little area here, zooming in, um, so we have what we refer to as the Greater Mesa Verde region, the Cayenta region, and of course, you know, Chaco and the Chuscas are down here, Glen Canyon is just to the west, um, and this is really the project area, so zoomed in a little more. So you can see on the, on the west, or excuse me, on the east, we have Comb Ridge, uh, Cottonwood Wash, on the south, the San Juan River, um, and then... Um, Basically, the edge of the Glen Canyon region kind of defines, and the Red Rock Plateau defines the area on the west, and then to the north, the Bears Ears. So, within this area, there are literally hundreds of thousands of archaeological sites. Um, and fortunately, only about 10% of that 100,000 uh, estimate that we have for the area have actually been systematically documented by archaeologists. And within the deep sandstone canyons in the area, there are literally hundreds of intact um, ancestral Pueblo cliff dwellings, uh, most of those dating to the 11, 12, and, and um, 11 and 12 hundreds. Um, so within these canyons, like I said, there's literally hundreds of these intact cliff dwellings, and um, many of these cliff dwellings have 
building murals, basically decorated wall surfaces. Um, but very few of these have ever been documented in detail. Um, and it's really fortunate because a lot of these murals, um, a lot of these structures, have intact wooden roofs and roof beams. And um, as Bill suggested, I work a lot with the laboratory tree ring research. Um, and so this is kind of the ideal situation for archaeologists. We can go to these sites. Um, you can see how well they're preserved just, just um, standing there for the last you know, several hundred years. Um, since folks left the area. Um, and so we can do, we can learn a whole lot without actually having to excavate. You know, excavation takes a lot of time. It's really expensive. I mean, I really enjoy excavation. It's a, it's a um, you know, really fruitful process. But um, there's a lot we can do just with what's standing there uh, to this day. Um, so, like I said, a lot of these sites have uh, building murals. They have wood, so we can potentially date when the structures are built and remodeled. Um, and then many of these murals uh, show cotton textile depictions or other types of woven textile depictions, um, which are really fascinating. Um, and then there's also a lot of evidence of actual textile production and use in these structures. So mural research is really still in its infancy in the Southwest. Um, but recent research suggests that murals can be used and have been used to signal uh, membership within distinct communities who shared common ideologies. You know, if you think about your houses, you go to your house now, there are certain things, certain ways you decorate your home that really, you know, make it stand out as having been um, decorated in this, in this political time, this, this era. Um, and that is true in the past as well. You know, people uh, basically used decorations and, and built their houses in certain ways that can tell you about the society at large and who they were interacting with. They can also indicate uh, waxing and waning social connections, both locally and, and in the larger region. And in southeastern Utah, most of the building murals that we have evidence of seem to date to just prior to the large-scale depopulation of the area at the end of the um, AD 1200s. So let's jump into a little theory first. You guys like theory? Um, I love theory, but uh, I, I, I promise I didn't put too much of it in here. Um, uh, just because it can kind of drag on. But so um, in, the, in the Southwest, um, we know that after 1300 AD, so basically after the period I'm looking at, um, people uh, often depicted uh, clothing and other types of um, activities in their, their building decorations, usually uh, from kivas, kiva murals is what we call them. And often, um, basically, people would show uh, figures wearing certain types of ritual garments. Um, this is uh, probably a painted cotton textile, um, and shows people in action doing things. They're wearing these act these these uh, clothes in their uh, in these activities. And we actually know from finding a few of these perishables, of course, are you know fewer and far between. But we, archaeologists actually found some of these textiles, and you can see um, pretty well. Hopefully, it shows up in this picture um, how well these match up with some of the actual garments these people are wearing. So we know that it's not just the idea of, oh, you know, maybe somebody should, you know, we're going to draw something, uh, the type of clothes maybe we'd like to make, or it would be neat if, if Sue wore this thing. But no, it's actually specific types of garments that people are actually wearing. Um, but it's, there was, there's more to it than that. Um, because not only did people decorate their, you know, uh, draw depictions of themselves wearing clothes, they also show the buildings being dressed. Basically, these buildings are being clothed. Um, so here in this depiction, uh, specifically, you can see these other types of textiles draped on the walls. And then around the, um, the rim here, you can see these necklaces basically draped on the walls. Um, and these necklaces have actually, some of these have been found also in Southwest Archaeological Sites. Uh, Barbara Mills has documented uh, in Chaco Canyon great kivas that uh, these uh, uh, necklaces of these types were probably draped on the interiors of great kivas during some type of building dedication ritual at the beginning of their use life. And then secreted away in niches, like you might see in Costa and Canada, at the close of those structures. Um, but we think that during their use life, they very, mel very well may have been draped on the walls. So um, basically what we should take out of this is that textiles um, can be used and were used by ancestral Pueblo people to basically to dress their structures. And what this does is um, it gives those structures identities. It describes a certain kind of animacy to them. 
makes makes them part of the family, if you will. Um, so again, you know, um, uh, people not only were were, were building their houses. Uh, in ways reflected who they were. They're also dressing their houses in the same types of clothing that they would use in certain types of, of ritual settings. Um, we don't really know about the origins of this, this uh, tradition, though. Um, and what I've been able to find out is that in the southeastern Utah, we actually have some of the earliest examples of, of this tradition. I'm not saying it started necessarily in southeastern Utah, but we have some of the best evidence, some of the earliest evidence for this type of, of, of uh, connection between clothing and, and building decorations. Oh, and there's the arrows. There we go. Coming right in there. So, like I was saying, so um, in southeastern Utah in particular, people seem to basically dress the world in this social skin. You know, if you think about it, our clothes are really so important to our identities, right? If we take off our clothes, we're all just a kind of bunch of funny-looking kind of apes. But when we put on our clothes, you put on who you are. You know, I'm, I'm a student. I'm a graduate student. I'm a, a law professor. I'm a, you know, a fireman, whatever. Clothing really is that, that, that fundamental piece that connects human identities with these social relations. And in southeastern Utah, people seem to decorate all sorts of things with depictions of clothing. Their homes, rock art, you know, wall surfaces, um, even pottery vessels. You can see the lower left here. This is what we think is, we call this background hatcher on this mesa pretty black and white bowl. That's thought to be the twill ribbing on a um, uh, twill woven tapestry, uh, excuse me, a twill, cotton twill tapestry um, uh, textile. Basically, it's a kind of residual effect you get from, from skipping, you know, over one, under two, over one, under two, the next row skips over, and it makes these, these ridges. Um, so people are clothing all, all types of things um, in southeastern Utah in particular um, with these clothing depictions. And as I suggested, um, a lot of these sites not only have these depictions of clothing, but we can see that there's evidence of production of those clothes in those same structures. Um, so up here at the left is um, one of the sites I'll be focusing on throughout the talk. Um, and in that, in that particular kiva, and then also in others that date similarly, uh, we found all sorts of evidence of cotton textile production. So this is a portion of a large uh, cotton uh, batten for weaving with upright loom. Uh, here's a loom anchor in the floor of a structure where they suspended a, a loom from the floor to the, to the um, or excuse me, the, the roof to the floor. Um, wooden awls seem to be associated with cotton textile production. You know, people use bone awls forever, but these wooden awls seem to really frequently show up in cotton production uh, settings. Um, this spindle whirl and spindle rod come from a cliff dwelling we dated to the, to the 1250s. Uh, another weaving batten, uh, more of a narrow one, maybe more like a heddle than actually like a batten. Um, and then this is one of my favorite artifacts. This is a yucca leaf tip needle. We call them finishing needles, is what they've been called in the literature. Um, and basically, it's the tip of a, of a yucca leaf. You know, they're sharp, and then they're full of fibers, right? So people made most of their fiber uh, clothing out of. Um, so they stripped away some of that, some of the pulp where they just had the fibers exposed. They twined that, applied it into a piece of string, and then they spliced it with this piece of cotton yarn. And what that's used for is basically finishing these cotton blankets when they're weaving on these upright looms. Um, we actually found that on the surface of a, of a kiva, we were mapping the inside of the roof. Looked down, it was right next to my foot. I got it and step on it. But, um, but uh, these things are just literally sitting out there. And, you know, that's another reason we'll get into, um, you know, why this area is so important and so special, because the preservation is just so incredible out here. Um, so that gets me right into this next slide is, you know, these resources are in danger. And as Bill suggested, you know, there's a lot of work, uh, lawsuits going on trying to um, reinstate or maintain uh, the original Obama designation for the National Monument. But regardless of, of what comes out of that, you know, we need to basically be really diligent in the work that we're doing. Uh, we need to document these sites. Like I said, there's, hundred, there's at least 100,000 archaeological sites in this area. Less than 10% have been systematically documented. Um, so there is a very real need to document these sites before they're gone forever. Um, and we do have a lot of increased visitation 
um, that is associated with the monument designation, but the area was becoming more popular for about the last decade. Francis Cedar Mesa has some great stats that show basically every year the number of visitors in the last decade have basically doubled every year. Um, so this area is on people's radars, and it's not going to drop off the radar, so we need to be really diligent about documenting these resources while we can. So this is one of the reasons that you know, a lot of the archaeologists in southeastern Utah are really uh, strong proponents for some type of, of federal designation, whether it's the actual, uh, whether it was the monument designation or a conservation designation, whatever. We re all really agree that you know, this place needs to be protected. We have situations like this. So this is a, a Kiva pilaster. You can see some idiot decided to be better off if they carved their name in there. This is really the most common situation, just looting. Basically, this is a big kiva. Actually, had a mural right in this little wall. We went there to document it, and um, it looks like a bomb crater went off. Um, this site had actually been actively looted for several years. While basically went, my crew, my crew member, and I went there to kind of scud it out. Um, yeah, there's a mural. Yeah, there's some wood. Let's come back next year and sample it. We came back the next year, and it had been looted again. And there was literally uh, pieces of gourd and string all around the inside of the kiva. They actually caught this guy. They'd, um, the BLM was aware of it. M myself and other folks have been, uh, you know, informing the BLM when we see situations like this. They put up a camera, and it was actually a grandfather who blamed it on his granddaughter. She told me to do it. I don't know. Um, but that's just, you know, it's, it's fairly common out there, and it, it's, it's still happening. So with all this in mind, um, back in 2013, I put together um, the Cedar Mesa Building Mural Project. Basically, um, it was designed to create baseline data of these fragile resources, basically document some of these sites, um, that have never been documented, even though they're incredibly spectacular. And this information is going to aid federal land managers, uh, at the BLM in particular, it's most of the lands I've been working on, uh, to establish management plans for the area. Um, it also is contributing tree ring data to the development of regional chronologies and paleoclimatic reconstructions, because that's one of the most direct ways we can create paleoclimates is through tree rings. Through presentations like this, um, I'm hoping to help foster the preservation ethic in the general public, although you guys, I think, all are um, already well along the way to, with that, obviously. Um, and then, of course, you know, not and important to me is contribute to my PhD research. Um, and, of course, I have to mention that, you know, this research in particular was funded by the Canyonlands Natural History Association. They do a lot of really great work for archaeologists and other types of um, conservationists uh, working in the area. Um, the laboratory retrieving research and the school anthropology provided me um, a number of uh, small grants and, and research funds. Um, the National Science Foundation uh, got a dissertation improvement grant through them. And then the Florence C. and Robert H. Uh, Lister Fellowship Program as well. So you got to always mention your, your funders, right? Very important. I want to keep them happy. Um, come on. There we go. So... Um, the Cedar Mesa Building Mural Project, that's really what I'm focusing on today. And so um, the advantages of this project is it's really light on impacts, but it's really heavy on results. So like I said, you know, there's hundreds of archaeological sites of these cliff dwellings and these canyons, um, but it would take way too much money and way too much time to go and excavate all of these, these sites, you know, fully. Um, and even doing these big systematic surveys is, of course, very important, um, but we have to start somewhere. We're working with the BLM archaeologists to say, wow, yeah, you know, we can't protect these places unless we know where they are. So, you know, get out there and start documenting. So um, what, what I've done in this project is basically work with a number of volunteers to conduct judgmental surveys, uh, basically doing literature reviews at Edge of the Cedars and other uh, institutions that have site files, finding out Kiva with intact plaster or talking to locals and say, oh, there's this really neat structure up there that has these designs, you know, all sorts of ways like that, and trying to hit up some of these um, maybe more well-known, but also um, the, more, the most fragile sites um, to, to document these. So it's a judgmental survey. We're not just doing random 
randomly selected parsecs on the, or parcels on the landscape. We're going to specific places. And then um, basically we're mapping and photographing uh, uh, sites and structures, especially ones with murals, and really focusing, you know, there's, there's tons of sites out there, but you have, to, you have to be more systematic. So we're going to a subsample of those sites that we found murals at, uh, kind of the best examples of different styles, and taking treating samples out of the roofs, mapping the roof structures, doing uh, in-field in artifact tallies, and um, at some sites, we're actually experimenting, experimenting with some photogrammetry, so 3D modeling. Um, and like I said, you know, this is really light on impact. So basically, all we take away from the site are cores that are, like, about smaller than my finger. Um, and we take those out of, the, out of the roofs, and we actually plug them back up with little numbers and stuff. Um, so it's really light on impacts, but really heavy on results. So um, over between 2013 and 2017... Um, worked with about 45 volunteers. Most of them were actually archaeologists that I knew from my work in the contract field or um, uh, other academics. And so these folks work in archaeology all week, and then they would volunteer for me in the heat of the summer in Utah to come over and do more archaeology. But it was great because I didn't have to really train that many people, but I also worked with you know folks that, that didn't have any experience. Um, so 45 uh, volunteers. We visited, visited over 150 sites. We mapped and or sampled uh, 28 structures at 16 sites. That's a more specific intensive documentation. We found 97 new instances of murals. Be previous to this, only 13 were known um, from this area. Um, and that was actually a really surprise because we thought they were, oh, they're really few, rare and few and far between. They are... But it seems like their distribution is, is much more plentiful than we had um, thought originally. Um, we obtained uh, 360 tree ring dates, and about a third of those returned dates after analysis, and that's actually uh, close to the normal average. Usually it's about one out of every three dates you send in the tree ring lab, return a date. Um, so I was pleased with that. And just generally, in the big sample, um, the dates uh, range between the 860s and um, 1268, which is exciting. 1268 had been the previous latest date in the area, and we found another site that matched those. Uh, so you can see here some of my volunteers uh, uh, working with, uh, including the notorious Tom Wines, uh, guru of, of Dendro archaeology in the southwest, taught me a lot with, about what I know, especially in terms of sampling. So just to give you an example, um, like I said, you know, I'm doing this research, but it's not just about my project. Uh, a big part of it is, is, is establishing and, and creating this baseline data of these sites. Um, so you can see here this, um, this really incredible site. This is one of the larger cliff dwellings in southeast Utah. Um, it's got about 20 rooms. We call it the wall site. There's its, its 42SA number. But it has these three layers here. Uh, three shelves that architecture was built upon. Um, and it actually had been previously documented back in 1978. This is the site map they drew for this incredible site. <laughs> Standards were different, let's just say, right? But, um, you know, we wondered if they'd actually gone to the site or just drawn it from across the way. You can see these daisy chain rock wall alignments. Just didn't quite capture, um, you know, really what's there. And then you know, in this, this push for the, the designation and the change of the designation, a lot of it is, you know, what are the resources? How many sites are there? Are these sites eligible for the, the um, National Register of Historic Places? Um, so this incredible site, you know, you might just not be getting everything that would tell you to push you to say, yeah, that's eligible under these different criteria just based on this previous documentation. So... Um, this is the kind of work we've been doing. So this is um, our map of that middle shelf here. You can see a little more detail. Um, and so we're drawing those structures and then, um, and then also putting you know, these beams, uh, these wooden beams, uh, noting those. We know exactly the context from which we can go back and take tree ring samples. So at this particular site, we took um, uh, samples out of this room and this room. This is a D-shaped kiva, also known as a kihu. You can see some of our volunteers working on it. And those two rooms are these, these now tied with the latest dates for the area, 1267 and 1268. But you can see, so a little more detail in our documentation. 
Um, but then, so getting back to the research then, so this is the, the big map of, of results for the area. Um, all these dots are sites that have building murals. Some of them have multiple dots, so you're not going to find 110 or so dots on there. But you can see the distribution is pretty evenly spaced across the landscape. And some of these holes, basically, especially like down in this area, just places I wasn't able to get to. You know, like Bill said, and like my committee has told me, you need to stop doing field work. So, um, you know, you, you don't need every data point, obviously, to see a pattern. Um, but you can see the pattern here pretty well. Uh, they're pretty evenly distributed across this, this big landscape. So um, uh, kind of an overview of the results then, um, before we jump down into some of the cool nitty gritty, um, is uh, it turns out that building murals in this region were made in one of four ways. So there's a... A fair bit of variability, but a lot of consistency. So the most common type of decoration are these incised decorations, basically scratched into or carved into the dry plaster, usually on the inside of structures, usually kivas. Often they show these cotton textiles or yucca sandals. Uh, this might be a tump band. Um, I don't know what this guy is, some type of naturalistic thing, maybe a cactus or a flower, hard to say. Um, Another type of mural are these inscribed decorations. And nobody had ever documented these before I started this project. So this is a new type of mural. And these are exclusively made on the exterior of call walls. Um, and they're really interesting because, so here you can see these sets of wavy lines basically drawn on the wet plaster um, when this wall was made. Here we have these sandal depictions, again, drawn into that wet plaster. And that tells us these were created right when the wall was made, which is really cool. So, you know, these inside decorations, you can replaster a kiva and draw more designs. But these ones, it's right at that moment of creation or uh, construction. The next most common after the incised murals are these painted, uh, usually bichromes, usually a combination of red and white. Sometimes they show textile depictions, sometimes they don't. And then in a few instances, I think there's only two or three, we actually have this white band that goes usually around the inside of a kiva. Um, and then it's, you can see these other later layers of plaster covering it. Um, so that's pretty neat, but major questions remain. So, you know, were these styles made contemporaneously or are they sequential? Do they vary in space? Uh, across the landscape, how similar are they to these, you know, the murals in the large, or building decorations in the larger region? Um, you know, how, where do we go from here? Well, that's where tree ring dating comes in. Of course, I gotta, you know, give hats off to A.E. Douglas, who invented tree ring dating, right? He was an astronomer, so when he first started look, figuring out tree rings, he actually used a telescope. We use, you know, the, we use, uh, oh, you'll see in a second, we use uh, binocular microscopes now, but he would set his tree ring at the other end of the room and look at it through those telescopes, because that's what he had, right? But he figured it out. Um, so um, enter tree ring dating. Um, so uh, as many of you probably probably know already, so this might be a review, but how tree ring dating works, basically we try to cross-date beams. Um, so we say started a living tree here. Here's its, take a quarter there, here's these rings. Thin rings are less precipitation, right? Fat rings are more precipitation. And uh, basically, you have these sequences. They go back in time to when the tree started growing. Usually, the rings aren't purple or blue or green, but for the sake of this illustration, they work really well. So then we take a core out of a dead tree, an older tree. We match that up. You can see these patterns are similar. And then we say go to a historic structure or eventually an archaeological site. And we keep pushing these chronologies back further and further and further. Now, thanks to the incredible work that's been done in the Tree Ring Lab for the last almost 100 years, um, we have these big master chronologies. So I was using, using the uh, Natural Bridges chronology that goes back to 97 AD, take my cores, sand them up, and I can try to match them up with that, with that master chronology. And this can tell us when a tree was, was cut down, or potentially when a structure was built by looking at clusters of tree rings, or even when a structure was, re structure was remodeled um, in an ideal situation. So here we go from basically uh, taking the sample to analyzing it. Um, so we have to sand the samples, we do the skeleton plotting, and then hopefully they, they cross state. Um, so if we jump back here, you can see that that crazy look in Tom's eye. Well, it is contagious. You can see that same look in my eye right there. 
And it actually it takes a lot of work. It's really it's uh, a lot of strength to, to drill into those those old beams. Um, but you can see just you know the types of samples we have. Uh, these are Douglas firs and juniper. Um, so what that tells us is when we put all this data together, basically is that this incised tradition started about 1215 AD and uh, continued into the 1270s. Earlier on in that time frame, uh, most of the incised depictions show textiles, either cotton-based uh, cotton -based textile, textile designs, or this is a sandal here. I'll show you more of those in a second. Later on, there's more naturalistic, like a bird. This a trace the drawing or trace the photo. This is a sheep. There's a herd of sheep on this on this panel. And again, you know, more flowers or some type of cactus. I'm not sure what that one is. Um, these incised murals, like I said, are really interesting because nobody had ever documented them previously. So in a site called Art House here, um, this call wall right here had uh, uh, this one of those incised or inscribed decorations on the outside. Another structure, uh, set of structures in Grand Gulch um, had, had another set, and we only know about two of those so far. Um, but you can see I'm a big person, um, and uh, I was worried about getting on this roof to take these samples, so luckily I have a great volunteer, Aaron, taught him how to do tree ring sampling, who weighs about 100 or so pounds less than I do. So we uh, hauled out a ladder and, um, and had him get up there to take these samples. You can see the roof underneath of that. This is Jonathan Till, the curator at Edge of the Cedars Museum, helping me out. And this was really interesting. So this wall right here, at the site in Grand Gulch, um, we cored some of these beams and got a, a non-cutting date of, um, or sorry, a near-cutting date of 1238 A.D. So we know the room has to date sometime after that, right? You can't, you can't decorate a wall before it's built. Um, and then this other wall here, this one at Art House, was really fascinating because we got a bunch of dates off that. It had um, a lot of uh, Douglas fir and some, some juniper. Um, and we had a slew of dates. And we, I can tell you this wall was built either, or I should say, the beams were cut and the wall was built soon after, either the fall of 1248 or the spring of 1249. We can get that precise with this number of dates. Um, and so even though we only have these two examples of this style of mural, it's interesting they date within about 10 years of each other. So, you know, that helps us to establish when this, these styles of decoration were, were in favor. So the painted murals presented a problem, though. Um, so unfortunately, most of the painted structures out there either don't have any wood or they don't have datable wood or they're really hard to get to. So here you can see this is a um, it's actually called greenhouse, but uh, enhanced photos so you can see the, the decorations a little better. Exterior mural, but they don't need to build a roof, right? Because you have the roof of the alcove right there. So they didn't they didn't use use any wood in there. Same in this structure. Um, sometimes in this time period, folks used cottonwood. It doesn't date. It just grows too fast. It grows too close to water. Um, or in this example, um, basically it looks like looters back in the early 1900s ripped the roof off and threw it over the edge of the alcove. Doesn't help us. So um, it was kind of an issue. The only um, example we had that was well dated would come from Moon House. And this site was well documented back in the 70s and 80s. Um, some of Bill Life's students um, uh, worked on this. And uh, uh, in Bloomer's 1985 uh, uh, master's thesis, he basically compiles all these treatment dates for the site. And what we know is this uh, wall here is a call wall. On the outside, it's covered with this incredible mural. So you can see here, there it is. This is the gallery that really exists. Um, and then the room right next to it um, has this, this white band with um, moon, a crescent moon, maybe it's a sun, there's a debate on that, um, moon or um, uh, crescent moon or full moon depictions, that's why it's called Moon House, and based on these wall construction uh, sequences, we can tell that this room was probably decorated sometime either after 1264 or 1267, because again, you can't, you know, decorate a wall before it's built, and this wall right here was built in 1264, 1267 as well. So it gives us this end point. But we had all this intervening time um, that we just didn't really know anything about for these murals. So I looked desperately high and low um, 
can see me squatting down in the bottom of this Kiva here, have a GoPro on a pole, looking into this site up here, all sorts of different ways. Um, I was trying to find some sites with, with datable wood. Like I said, some of these are just really hard to get to. Here's an example of one we actually did get into. I'll talk more about that in a sec. But um, a lot of these these really late, you know, I think they're pretty pretty safe to call them defensive sites. Um, this is about halfway up uh, one of the deeper canyons in, in uh, Cedar Mesa. And uh, you can walk from the bottom up to this ledge pretty easily. Um, you know, it takes a little scampering, but it's, it's not too hard. But then to get that last little bit up to the site, here you can see the kivas, you have to walk on this ledge. And this is 100 foot down below here to this, this other alcove. It's not a hard walk. It's just terrifying, <laughs> right? And uh, this ledge slants, and there's, there's some hand toehold steps cut. But um, basically, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with heights. I don't really like edges, um, <laughs> which isn't, isn't great for this type of work. But um, so I had uh, climbers come help. Um, and I got special permission from the BLM, and I want to make sure that's really clear. Don't go do this on your own. You'll either get arrested or you'll die. Um, and I'm, I'm serious. So, yeah, you can see this, like, 30-foot stretch. Just, it's, it's not, I don't know how old people got in there. I don't know how kids stayed in there. I don't know how they got water in there. It's, it's a mystery. Basically, what we did is you can see this tree that looks like it's growing off the edge. It's actually this old juniper that's, like, 500 years old. And we had a climber put a rope around that, and we ascended up and rappelled down. Because it was the only way to get in and out safely with people and gear, right? The BLM, that's their main thing. Don't hurt the site. Don't hurt people. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so like I said, we got special permission from the BLM uh, to use uh, ropes to get in some of these sites. Um, so I had two main climbers, uh, Greg Child, not to be confused with Craig Childs. Greg Child is a famous international climber. He climbed Everest. Um, he told me he tried to climb K2 without oxygen. He was in charge of the Range Creek um, project where they got into all those inaccessible granaries. He was the head climber for that National Geographic project. Um, he lives in Moab and is friends on the Friends of Cedar Mesa board, so uh, we got his help. And then another guy named Pete Davis. Um, I guess he's not in that picture right there. Um, so at one site, we had to do a series of repels, 300-foot repels, three separate 100 foot repels to get in, another one to get out and walk along uh, the back up to the talus slope. And then this one here, that I showed you a picture of, we had to ascend up every morning, full body workout. Um, it takes like half an hour and then you have to repel down at the end. It was really exciting. Um, but uh, it was a lot, a lot of work. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so I, you know, I have to say thanks to these, these great climbers. Um, but so putting that, that day together, we were able to get um, into some of these sites with painted murals uh, that would otherwise be impossible to get to. So Angel's Rest here, you can see this, this kiva or some type of flat-roofed uh, storage room here. Uh, right above it has this beautiful red band with these uh, white upward-pointing triangles. Um, the painted kiva over here, you can see uh, myself and Aaron O'Brien, one of my volunteers, mapping this structure. Um, that's the one we had to ascend into. It has this incredible um, cotton textile-based mural going around, one of the best. And then there's this, which we call the crawl in your belly, like a reptile site. Because of one of those hard-to-get-to or hard-to-reach uh, access points, um, and inside this kiva with this perfect flat roof um, is probably the best mural in maybe the region. Uh, this white, uh, red and white painted mural. So I'm going to show you how we put the seriation together real quick. So how, how do we put it all together? How do we figure out the, you know, the dates and the styles and such? Well, um, we, this is one of the sites we mapped. It's basically a small um, one uh, family habitation, probably has a kiva and some storage rooms and habitation rooms. This one has a cribbed roof with uh, 12 layers of, of cribbing. It had like 150 beams. Um, and so we sampled uh, 36 of those, and we got uh, dates off of 10. So like I said, a little less than a third. Um, we mapped these roofs, and, uh, the roof of it, and so this is each layer being added over the course. Like I said, about 150 beams. This map took about 20 hours to make, just the base map. My volunteer is great, but we didn't want to talk to each other for like three months after this. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so it turns out that this tells us that this structure was built right at 1215 A.D. 
Um, and then it was probably remodeled right at 1229. We have two beams that come out of the top of the hatch cover, which basically is the, the easiest pieces to replace. They were from the same tree that date right at 1229. So that tells us, gives us basically a, um, a span on this. And we look inside the kiva, there's a cross section here. You can see there's at least about three layers of plaster uh, that are visible. There might be some washes that are thinner, but we, it's hard to really tease those out. On the innermost layer, you can see where the plaster has fallen away, there's this sandal depiction scratched, carved into the first layer of plaster. And then on the outermost layer, there's another one. I've traced this drawing, of course, but another type of a textile, probably a, a different type of sandal, um, d depicted on the outermost layer. So that tells us that, you know, basically that's the style people are using in this structure from its, from its construction until the end of its use life. So we put that on a timeline here. So 1200, 1250, so 1215, 1229, and then we usually add about a 15-year projected use life. So, you know, after you build a uh, earthen structure, usually they can last for about 15 or so years before you have to do some major remodeling, right? If we have to, they're full of bugs or it's too sooted, you have to do some pretty major upkeep. Um, so we put that on a timeline, that's great, but we want, you know, more data, of course. So we go to another structure, this one in Natural Bridges, uh, worked with uh, uh, the NPS and UNM to document this structure. And um, it's got these layers of plaster on the outermost layer, has these incised cotton uh, textiles, and then also these sandals, loom anchors in the floor that tells us one of these upright looms was, was suspended in there, and all sorts of tools came from this structure as well. Um, that structure was uh, remodeled substantially in 1216 AD. On the inside, this is actually probably the best example of this incised tradition. Uh, like I said it has these, probably this is probably the bottom of a cotton belt, or I mean, sorry, a cotton blanket. Uh, maybe showing a cotton blanket, kind of mini version there. These are blown up, those are probably tump bands. And then all these sandals, lots of these sandals. You can see a couple of these little toe jogs, really characteristic. So then we put that on the timeline. Oh man, it matches up pretty close. That's great, right? So then uh, we go to another structure. This one was really interesting. Um, all, it's known as the Slickhorn Perfect Kiva. Had some incised sandals, but then on top of it, it had some painted elements, which you hadn't seen before. We took, it, we took dates, Tom Wines dated this structure, and lo and behold, it's slightly later, right? So I don't want to belabor the point because we looked at a lot of structures, but if we put all that data together from both my work and stuff that Tom Wines has done and some of these other projects, um, we can see basically the chronology of these structures with murals. Um, we put the, some nice highlights on there. And you can see basically from about the, what is it, the 1100s, um, all the way up to basically the 1270s, um, we have structures with murals, right? And that's kind of hard to see. So let's, let's look at it a different way. Um, so we can break this up by style. So we can see um, earlier on, or the earliest examples we know about, and of course, people were making decorations probably much before, for a long time before this, but we just don't have the preservations on open air sites in the mesa tops. About early 1200s, people seem to move into these canyons really heavily in Cedar Mesa. And so we just have that the better preservation. Um, but the few structures we have with 1100 dates with some type of building decoration um, are these, these interior single bands that go around in the inside of the structure. Then on top of that, um, at least in this case, you can see there's some plaster in this one. There's some incised designs. Probably can't see it in that picture. But, um, but this, and like I said, at other structures, basically we can see that um, this incised decoration tradition is, is somewhat later. Basically it picks up about 1215 or so and goes all the way to the end of the, the sequence on the, probably 1270 or so. Then we have these inside, or inscribed decorations, like I said, made in the exterior of call walls when they're wet, a date within about 10 years of each other, at least the two examples we know about. Um, and then we have actually a little bit of overlap where we have some inside decorations with the painted murals, painted decorations on top of them. Um, and then we have these structures that have either full-on painted murals, or there's also a select set that have these shield depictions, either associated or right above the kiva, probably, probably made when somebody was standing on that roof. 
um, or in some type of direct connection like that. So we can see that um, over time, basically, we start out with this, uh, this, this single white band tradition, but pretty quick at about the beginning of the 1200s, it uh, seems like um, some type of local tradition where a lot of people are all making their, their designs or decorating their structures in the same ways. But then, right at about 1250, this new tradition sprouts up, this painted tradition. Um, and it's seemingly kind of out of, out of nowhere. Um, one question I've had is, you know, is it a new group of folks moving in? I don't think so, because the rest of the site, the structures and the construction, are all basically the same types of, uh, of technologies and, and method methods that people had used locally in the area, but then they start making these painted walls. So to get into some of the discussion here, so uh, the sandals. What's up with the sandals? Well, there's a bunch of types of sandals people use in the southwest, uh, in the northern southwest. Um, the most of the depictions in murals seem to be this, this fanciest type, these twine sandals here. Uh, during the Pueblo II and III periods, uh, these were kind of the, the fanciest textiles out there, kind of the pinnacle of weaving technologies for in the ancestral Pueblo uh, world. Each one has over 100 foot of cordage, plied cordage in it. Um, if you took it apart, it's over 250 foot of, of string. They have dyed yarns. They have raised treads. Um, no two pair are exactly alike. This is the, the other component of my dissertation, doing museum work uh, with Lori Webster, looking at these sandals to kind of compare them to the murals. I've uh, been to a bunch of museums there, uh, both back east and, and more locally. Um, and so with these sandals, basically they... They're really cool because basically they're stamps of identity, right? When you walk, you leave these stamps of, of who you are. Um, so they have these raised treads. Here's an example of somebody's nodding. It's not really nodding, but it's uh, easy to refer to it like, like that. You can see the way those are made on the bottom here. And then they put them together in these more complex designs. So you can't really see unless you either look at the bottom in a certain light or you walk with it. Um, this is the SAA's Society for American Archaeology, right? They give you some swag every year. So a couple years ago, the, the meeting was in uh, Honolulu, so they gave everybody sandals. And it's a little bit opposite. They have these recess designs instead of raised treads, but it gives you the same kind of sense. Um, here's an example of just some of the, the variability of those raised tread decorations um, that I've come across. You can see there's a lot of variability, but then there's a lot of consistency too, especially in certain certain sites. Some of them um, show depictions we see only on certain types of special use vessels, like uh, these uh, cylinder vessels from Chaco Canyon. Or the dripping line motif is really common in the northern southwest on pottery decorations. Where does the design come from? Well, prob oh, probably um, these, these sandals that actually have that design woven into the actual structure of it. Some of them, uh, like from Aztec ruins here, this is the most common design in Aztec, looks like these kind of simplified versions of the Chaco uh, de Goji style designs. Now in southeastern Utah, and at Mesa Verde National Park, these are more Pueblo III era sandals, um, they match up really well with our Pueblo III pottery. So Macalmo black and white, and Mesa Verde black and white pottery designs. They're made into these thicker, denser designs. Um, much like the pottery increases in density over time, the designs do, so do the sandals. And this is probably what, um, this is kind of a mock-up, but it seems to be playing out as I do the more research. Basically, uh, we can see that the sandals actually um, varied across, across space. And each kind of larger community probably had their own types of sandal decorations. Basically, when you walked in soft soil, somebody would know, oh, there's Barbara, she's from Tucson. Oh, there's Wyatt, he's from Louisiana. Except it's, you know, within the four corners here. Um, and in southeastern Utah, most of those designs on the sandals and then also on the murals and in the rock art have this kind of zigzag or diagonal uh, orientation. So basically, it seems like when people are talking about those or at least referring to those in, in murals, they're talking about local kind of, of, of identities. As you can see here, a one-to-one... -one um, here's a sandal from American Museum of Natural History from Grand Gulch. And uh, this is a drawing I've done of those treads. And you can see it matches nearly identically to this mural from Natural Bridges. And so mapping those out on the landscape, you can see again our Bears Ears boundary here. 
Um, you can see a lot of these uh, uh, mural, these structures with murals with sandals, or even the rock art, really are scattered right around that area. So it seems like a very local development in the region. The thing is, you have to be pretty close to see these. So here's an example. You can see my footprints. And as you go off in the distance, that message, you kind of lose the details, right? You can't quite make out the, the full message. Um, well, that seems to be have played out in these actual sandals, too. So if we look at what we call the proxemics, or basically how, how close or far can you be to actually take that message in? Well, the structures, usually kivas that have incised murals, um, are usually pretty small. And they're on the interiors of those structures. So you probably have to be pretty close to get that full message. Um, so here you can see, you know, even from just a few feet away, it might be kind of tricky to make it out unless you, um, you know what you're looking for. But over time, right here, we can see that as this painted mural tradition builds up, or starts to build up steam, I should, steam, I should say, um, the structures start to get larger and larger. And so it seems like, you know, these painted designs are much bigger and bolder. You can see them from further away. Um, they're probably actually referring to more cotton types of garments, big white blankets and stuff you're wearing. Um, you can see from, from greater distances. So first we have this, uh, like I said, you have to be real close and personal, taking these incised decorations. And that size of the structure increases over time. And then eventually we get these galleries. So like the Moon House Gallery here. You can probably fit two or three times more people in that structure than you could in these, these small kivas, and the murals basically are, are reflective of that. Um, as that tradition keeps going, we start to see exterior murals as well. So up here above Moon House, um, and even this, this cliff dwelling here, you can see this red and white paint. You can see that from half a mile away. So this, the, the visibility of these decorations seems to correlate with the actual textiles they're making and increase over time. That tells us that basically the audiences that are meant to take that in are also getting bigger. So we can see right at the end of the sequence here, basically between about 1250 to 1270, um, we see that this is happening across Cedar Mesa, where we start to have these bigger, bolder designs, like I said, probably indicating uh, they were meant to be seen by more people. We have decorations like shields, uh, often up above sites like this, um, that you can see from a long ways away. And if they're shields, you know, is that telling us maybe there's some type of violence that's coming in to this society? We look at this then in the landscape. You know, this is this mural tradition, the painted tradition, is building up right when the depopulation started. The depopulation of this area basically starts at 1250, and by 1275, everybody's gone. Um, in the rest of the Mesa Verde region, hang out a little bit longer, but not a whole lot. But you can see if we map out then the dates, these are the latest dates from the, from the trees uh, in the roofs of these structures, we map that out, we can see they're actually earlier in Cedar Mesa, in the southern Bears Ears, a little bit later in Mesa Verde National Park, and then in the Guyana area as well, uh, a little bit later. And this looks like then the earliest versions of this actually start in southeastern Utah. So this might be some type of social movement, maybe political or religious, that's basically tied with the beginning of that depopulation. And as people start to leave, it seems like they're taking these to, other, to the places they're, they're, they're ending up. Um, so Mesa Verde, Canyon de Chez, that type of area. So you can see here, by the end of the 1200s, this is a mural tradition that spread rapidly, but then now is in a lot of places in the Four Corners. Um, and we can see, basically, that tells us that people are talking about a similar message, right? They're relating a similar theme. Uh, but there's certain nuanced variations of that as you get into other places. So you can see that southeastern Utah, these are all these murals with these downward pointing uh, triangles. Here we have in southeastern Utah. What are the differences? Can you see? Kind of gave it away, I guess. As you head over to the, to the east, to the right of the screen. What's the difference? They're pointing up, right? Now, I wish I could take credit for noticing that. Scott Ortman and, and Sally Cole noticed that, but they had a very small sample. And now we have a whole lot of uh, examples. Um, but you can see just about right at Comb Ridge seems to be roughly that boundary where uh, the triangles point down in these murals, and then you go to the other side and they point up. This is like uh, uh, Cliff Palace here. This is Aztec ruins, uh, Canyon de Chez. Um, 
and there's a little bit of overlap pointing down and up. Don't quite know what's going on there. But, um, but yeah, so that tells us, you know, that this is, like I said, a message that spread across the region rather quickly and really was probably part and parcel to whatever that idea was, why people are leaving, why the depopulation started and continued. This is part of that in some way. So that kind of wraps up what I was hoping to talk to you about today. But, you know, I just want to reinforce, you know, this, these landscapes, especially in southeastern Utah, these resources are in danger. And, you know, please continue to, you know, support and advocate for the protection of public lands. Um, you know, if you can, uh, if you're able to, give money to your advocacy groups, nonprofits, Arch Southwest, of course, Friends of Cedar Mesa, Canyonlands Natural History Association, all these folks working really hard to protect these landscapes. Um, and they, they could use our help. Um, so I just want to thank, you know, there's a lot of folks, I, I won't read through this whole list, but uh, especially uh, the Kenny Lands Natural History Association uh, for funding this research, uh, National Science Foundation, um, especially the, uh, also the, the School of Anthropology and the Laboratory of Treatment Research, and then uh, Arc Southwest for all the great work they're doing and also for inviting me here. Um, so I'll leave you with that. Uh, last picture I'll show you, this is... I gave a talk in, last November in Santa Fe, and uh, Ricardo Cate, the, the famous native artist, was, was in the audience, and he drew this for me, right, as I was talking, uh, so I had to throw it in there. But, uh, but yeah, thank you very much. Um, any, any questions? Yeah, that's a good question. Right, right. Well, that's a good question, and and that's you know going to be you know a supplementary type of study down the road is you know looking at some of these now that we know the the where the sites are and where the painted sites are, so we can we could actually go to those and do some um, some type of uh, documentation of the the minerals. Um, it's most like likely that they're using some natural pigment, just natural clays. Um, uh, but I know that there's some painted murals at Lowry over in, in southwest Colorado that Sally Cole has done some, um, what is it, portable XRF on, and it turned out the white in those pigments was almost entirely ground lead, um, and that whoever processed it and applied it probably went crazy. <laughs> like, literally, the, the levels are really elevated. Um, it doesn't seem like that. These these pigments aren't quite as bold, um, so I think it's more of a natural pigment, but uh, that's probably what they're using for those handprints as well. Those seem to be relatively contemporaneous. You mean the negative ones, right? Yeah, yeah, those often occur at these really late sites as well, but often. I mean, you know, rock art is much more difficult to date, but uh, but probably. Yeah. Oh, the question was, what are they using to make the plaster, and what are they using to make the paints? Um, so the the like I said, the, we just talked about the pigment. Um, we still need to you know do more research on that, but it seems to be natural clays that occur in the area, and we have um, some blue clays and gray clays, and and all the dirt, most of the dirt out there is is red. So uh, so that one's really easy to to get. Um, and the plaster, um, it seems to be basically just. Um, uh, pretty silty and uh, clay um, uh, uh, mud that they're basically they're adding. Sometimes they'll add a little bit of midden material to, maybe some ash to get it time to, to adhere, um, and and basically then just coating the interior surfaces when it's pretty wet. It's usually a pretty wet substance as well, um, and it varies. Uh, some layers, some kivas you'll go into, and like one layer will be dark red, and the next will be like a pink. Um, and so it seems like they're getting those source materials from somewhere slightly different sources, but it all seems to be really localized. Like, it's not like they're going, you know, out of, out of their way to, to get these pigments. They seem pretty localized. Yeah. The, the question is, um, uh, what effect does drought have on the tree rings? And then um, do I see, have I seen evidence of basically the, what we have called the great drought in uh, potentially pushing or pulling folks out of the area. Um, so yeah, the short answer, um, gosh, <laughs> there's not really a short answer to that one. Um, 
Climate, of course, plays a, played a big role in these people's lives. They were farmers. They were subsistence farmers. And most of the, the farming seems to have occurred on the mesa tops. The canyons are too narrow and is too active to really um, allow for any substantial crop production. Um, and so there's basically mostly dryland farming. So when droughts did come through, um, or uh, that would have a significant effect on yields, um, the great drought, and there's been a lot of work on this in the last, you know, 10, 15 years, and uh, Aaron Wright's done some great stuff on his, his master's thesis on this. Um, it seems like the great drought was kind of overblown in the, the press it's gotten. Um, so in this area in particular, with my work and some of the work Bill Leip's done, it, it looks like the end of the occupation really, like I said, people start to leave the, cedar, the, the southern Bears Ears in the 1250s. Um, before my research, Moon House was the site that's called the holdout that, went, that was occupied into the late 1260s and early 1270s. Now, Tom Wines and I have now have over a dozen sites that now are date in that 1260s uh, decade um, and maybe push into the 1270s. But um, so we haven't really had the chance to revisit that too much because the, the big, the great drought, as we call it, really picks up in the mid to late 1270s um, in, the, in the Four Corners, across the Four Corners. So at least in terms of the Southern Bears years, most everybody was gone before that even, before it even started. And um, folks have looked at the, basically the mid 1100s drought that happened right at the end when the Chaco system started to really reorganize substantially. Um, and that was probably a more prolonged and more severe drought than anything that happened in the 1200s. And so, and people survived that, and they lived in these areas, you know, throughout that time period. Of course, people might have moved around a bit. Um, but, so it seems like, you know, people had gone through more severe climatic uh, stress. Um, so it's difficult to say, yeah, that, you know, that could be the cause of it. Um, like I said, in the, in the Southern Bears years, people were already leaving before that even was a, before it, before it happened. So, you know, people aren't going to re move around before a drought starts, right, in, in response to it anyway. So, so I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's the timing of it. If you go into the, the Mesa Verde region to the east, um, people were living there until probably the mid-1280s. And we do see this big buildup of occupation, right, at like Mesa Verde National Park, which is a high elevation area that still had a long growing season, but also um, um, would have a lot of precipitation. So we do see buildup in place, buildup of occupation in places like that, um, but but not in this particular area. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, in general, speaking generally about tree rings, that's one of the ways that we recreate these climate reconstructions. Um, is, you know, these fat, the fatter the ring, the more precipitation, the narrower ring, the, the, narrow, the less precipitation. And so we can look at these kind of annually resolved um, uh, fluctuations in precip precipitation for different areas. Um, so we do see some of those kind of more localized warm or uh, wet and dry periods, um, but really they are reflective on a bigger scale, this, the bigger regional patterns. So we do see that a big 1100s drought in the trees. Um, we do see you know, this, the, the great 1200s drought in some of the trees that were used uh, at that point in time. Um, but, but I don't know, it's, it's, I used to be much more environmentally driven in my research, thinking, okay, you know, climate makes me do something. But um, especially since coming to the U of A, where we really focus a lot more on behavior and, and the social side of things, I've really kind of stepped away from that and a lot more careful because, you know, Pueblo societies lived in these areas for thousands of years. They farmed these places for a long, long time. So they had these mechanisms um, in their technologies and in their oral traditions that helped them get through these, these types of events. Um, so, I've done, so I don't know. I don't want to commit to saying, yes, the climate made, made them do this or didn't do that. Um, so, you know, tree rings are a way you can look at droughts, but uh, with my particular research, I'm not seeing the, the response to climate change in this specific case. Thank you. All right. <laughs> There's a, no short answer to that one. <laughs> yeah. 
That was an outlier. Um, it actually turned out to be from there was one roof at, in one particular site um, where all of the beams dated to 865, and what and it was a very old room that had been remodeled for several hundred years. On the outside, it actually had one of those painted murals on the outside. We could tell by looking at the architecture and the actual wall construction. It had been replastered and shored up, and they'd closed up a door and broken another one. And so that actually is, it does look like that's actually a real Pueblo One, uh, 860s era uh, cliff dwelling, which is really one of the only cliff dwellings we know. And it's just one room, but it is a very significant room because of that. Um, so there are a few kind of, you know, I didn't have time to get into all that, but uh, we did have a few anomalies like that where we had a 860s room, another site we had a big construction event in the mid 10 hundreds, um, which is like the only P2 cliff dwelling in the area. Um, so we did have some anomalies like that, but you know, those don't really help in this particular story. Yeah. No, no, pretty much I was trying to look at any type of building decoration that was available, and they all happened to, in this area, in this time period, be mainly textile-based. And like I said, I think it's because they're conceptually dressing their, their structures. If you go to other parts of the Southwest, um, and especially later in time, you do see a lot more kind of figurative um, depictions of animals or people doing things. But that, at least in this early version of that tradition, of mural traditions, they weren't doing that in this particular area. Yeah, good question though. Yeah, I can get to part of that. Um, yeah, so cotton, cotton, yeah, <laughs> cotton comes from this part of the of the world. I mean, at least you know, if, if through from Mexico came up through the Sonoran Desert. Um, the earliest evidence we really have of cotton production versus just a random art, uh, textile or something. Um, the earliest evidence of cotton production is from Antelope House in the 900s, 900 AD. Um, and then we don't have a lot of, of really solid production evidence. We have a little bit scattered around, like maybe some type of ritual production in Chaco Canyon at certain sites. Um, but really it's not until the 1100s that we really see it take off. Um, and it seems to come up through the Cayenta area, so through north, northeastern Arizona. Um, and then by sometime in the early 1200s, late 1100s, it gets to southeastern Utah. At that point, most of the cotton uh, weaving is with a backstrap loom. So you have like an anchor point, your small loom, and then you have a belt that you're leaning against for tension. Um, but somewhere, sometime between the late 1100s and the mid-1200s, People either in southeastern Utah or northeastern Arizona, somewhere in that area, they actually invent the upright loom. So it comes from that area. Um, and that's one of the reasons when I see these loom anchors and, and other tools in some of these sites, I get so excited because that's this homegrown industry. And it seems to, the thought working with Lori Webster, she thinks that, um, you know, she's the perishable expert for the most of the Southwest. Um, she thinks that they're actually um, producing ritual garments to be traded to other places uh, in the 1100s, and that's a, uh, basically a pattern she sees um, extended in later in time. We have like the Western Pueblos were really a hotbed for cotton textile production uh, for the rest of the Southwest. Um, so we think that's that's kind of how it's going on. Um, I know some folks right now, Karen Adams and, and Lori Webster, are working on doing some initial a pilot study DNA test, trying to look at the DNA of some of this cotton from southeastern Utah and I think Tularosa Cave, and compare that with the modern or sorry historic Pima and historic Hopi cotton um, to see how that that extends. But it's that's just really in its initial stages and. It's difficult because you need cotton seeds. You can't use just the hairs to get the DNA. Um, so those are harder to come by. Like even when I see cotton evidence, I see looms and spindles and string, but the seeds are really, really rare. Um, I'm a little confused then. You're, you're, they cultivated the cotton themselves, but it was from seed or brought up from South America. Well, I mean, from Mexico. I mean, over thousands of years. Yes, that's correct. Okay, that's correct. That's correct. Um, it seems like cotton comes from Mexico. Okay. 
uh, gets his foothold here, and then eventually gets up to the four corners. Yeah. Do we have more time, or? One more question. Okay. Uh, I think you had your hand up first. Yeah, um, well, there's several styles. Um, The most common one is just uh, basically you take your digging stick and you kind of do this kind of motion. It kind of drills down into the plaster floor of a structure a bit. Um, Sometimes you can actually see the the grooves from the digging stick. It makes you have a hole, a cylinder. Then they take a piece of wood, um, a willow limb or something, bend it over. Sometimes attach kind of an anchor to the bottom, kind of tie it. Often they have a corn cob in there. Um, and then they bury it up, so it's just basically this, this loop sticking above the floor. Fill that in with mud. That's the most common type. Um, sometimes they, they drill through. If it's a sandstone floor, they'll drill through. Um, and then uh, there's another type in Arizona. It's like a, like a toggle kind of, where they have a, a string with a stick at the bottom, and they have it stuck in the hole, and then it pokes up above the surface. But then usually it's like four or five in a row. And then the bottom piece of the loom, let's see if I back this up. Um, you can see, right, this is so slow. Well, so then they suspend it. <laughs> they have, uh, basically have several in a row, tie strings to it, and then um, they have another bar suspended from the roof beams. And then they'll, they'll basically have... The, you know, all the, the lacing in between that, it tightens it up, so it's this really taunt thing. gives it a lot of uh, um, um, resistance, and then so that makes it so you can weave, you can weave in there. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that picture is way at the beginning, so it's going to take too long. But, um, but yeah, so th- thank you very much, and uh, that's it.